<laughs> and I am practicing my wing and all of my eyeliner situations. So, <laughs> so funny. Your makeup looks dope. Looks really good. So I'm going to stop feeling it too much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm like, come on. We're going we to keep it together. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how emotional I can be. So, yeah, I, I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> All good. All good. All right. So I think we should go ahead and get started. Okay. So thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate from slave cabinets of the White House, homebound citizenship in African American culture. My name is Heather, and I'm the publicity manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just going to go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to Brittany and Carissa for being here today. They're gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then we will have time for a 30 minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And then I will pass those along to Brittany and Kalifa. We'd also like to thank Semicolon Bookstore for partnering with us on this event. Should you wish to purchase any of Kalifa's or Brittany's books, please visit Semicolon's page on bookshop.org. I have it linked in the chat box. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. So no need to worry if you have to duck out early, you can still watch it later. Watch our social media for an announcement. And now I will just briefly introduce our guests. Caritha Mitchell is an associate professor of English at Ohio State University. She is the author of the award-winning book, Living with Lynching, African-American Lynching Plays, Performance and Citizenship, 1890 to 1930, published by the University of Illinois Press. She is also the editor of the Broadview edition of Francis E.W. Harper's novel, Lola Leroy. Her latest book, which we are here to celebrate today, is From Slave Cabins to the White House, Homing Citizenship in African American Culture. Brittany Cooper is an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and Africana studies at Rutgers University. She is the author of the award-winning book, Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race Women, published by the University of Illinois Press. She is also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower, published by St. Martin's Press. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Brittany and Karitha. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. Thank you, Heather. Hey, Karitha. Hey, Brittany, good to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you. Congratulations on this new book. I'm Thanks. so excited to talk about it. Um, Man, sis, you've done some some amazing work in this book, and there's so many things to talk about. And so, um, wow. So first, I just want to ask you, you make a really sort of huge intervention and a shift that I think is going to, to be with, with us for many generations of scholarship to come, wherein you challenge us to stop thinking about Black culture, Black politics through the lens of resistance solely and protest. Uh, and you introduce a new, a new framing. You ask us to think about notions of Black success. Uh, and you ask us to do that as a, as a way to suggest that it is not that Black people are merely reacting to what white people are doing, but rather that white violence and white supremacy are themselves the reactionary projects. So I wonder if you would say a little bit about how you came to like, what was the day like when you sort of came to that epiphany that we were framing our telling wrong in many cases? Thank you so much for that. Yes. And that is exactly what I hope is that it will really make us pause, um, really make us think again. Is this really what we want to be doing? Is this really how we want to um, honor our forebears? Um, have we really been reading the record that they actually left? Um, and I love the way you frame that as, you know, a particular day. I can't say that I know the particular day, but what I know for sure is that writing living with lynching is a big part of it, <laughs> right? Like, because it became so clear to me in writing Living with Lynching that you weren't lynched because you did something wrong. You were lynched because you saw yourself as a human with rights. You saw yourself as a citizen with 
the uh, ability to assert a kind of citizenship and belonging that someone wanted to remind you, oh no, that's not how we see you here. Yeah. And so because living with lynching was so clear about the fact that um, these playwrights, as well as the characters that they write, they knew that the reason this was happening was because they were successful. So I guess part of the way that I can kind of get to the heart of the way you frame that question for me is to say that I just am thinking to myself, we speak in terms of anti-Blackness, mm -hmm. but then we act as if the anti-Blackness is the thing that Black people are responding to. No, 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 it's anti-Blackness, which means I'm primary and the white violence is secondary. And so I think that that is, you know, kind of going to the heart of why I think that if we assume that it's protest and we assume that it's resistance, that's the reason we're naturally going to have misreadings because we're granting to white supremacy a victory that its own reactionary nature shows it knows it hasn't won. Mm -hmm. Wow. So talk to me a little bit in, in that regard then about like success. Cause, Cause as you use that term throughout, I was like, this is an interesting choice in terms of like so other people would say freedom or they would say liberation and but you sort of argue for this capacious and contingent idea about success that shifts over time right so why success yeah thank you for that that's so crucial because so many times what has happened over the the years of writing and thinking through this book is that people would say well that's not success that's just survival or that's not success that's just resistance and what i'm interested in doing is saying okay but if you look at the text it's very clear that the texts are constantly telling us a story of how the people who are being narrated are defining success and i love your word there contingent right the reason why they're defining and redefining and then redefining and then defining again is because every iota of success is going to be resisted. So to my mind, part of what's so crucial for us to grapple with is in the, in the long duration of slavery itself, are we doing our forebears a service by assuming that they're investigating or exploring something other than success? I mean, why wouldn't they be interested in thinking about how they're going to define it, right? And so to my mind, that's the reason why success is so important because it then makes us have a kind of granular attention to, uh, uh, here's a great example, right? Incidents in the life of a slave girl. Yeah. Part of what I'm invested in is the way that she has a definition of success. And then she encounters opposition to the fact that she's been able to cultivate a, a romantic attachment to this free man. Now, the fact that you have even cultivated that attachment is already an achievement because everything that is everything the country is doing is designed to tell you you're not even human, to tell you that the emotions you have are some order that's different from human emotion, to tell you that any attachments you feel are weaker than what white people feel. Like all of that is part of what you're being bombarded with. So the idea that she would hold on to her humanity and agency enough to not only know that about herself, but then also to have cultivated any kind of connection with this free black man that wants to buy her, that's an achievement. Because it's an achievement, even in the horrors of slavery, Dr. Flint pounces. Right. So I guess what I'm interested in is that when that door is closed and Dr. Flint says, I'm gonna kill him like I would a dog, does that mean that she then has resigned herself to failure? No. Actually, now she's defining success as, I may not be able to be a free wife and mother, but I'm going to keep myself from being raped. That actually now is my definition of success. To my mind, that's not just surviving. That's not just resisting. That is a definition of success that had to be tweaked. But she did that tweaking. And part of what these texts do is they give us the details of what it takes to do that tweaking. So you can see a shift 
and how she's thinking about success from that moment on. And I just think that if we're looking for the evidence that is left around these real investments, even in the slavery era, in defining success, we will see it. We will notice it. We can be true to the evidence they left. Yeah. And, and part of what that success is then pegged to, you argue, is really a, a new way of thinking about citizenship, a mode of citizenship that you call, you call homemade citizenship, right? This idea that as Black people continue to define and redefine success, that they are often defining it in the context of what's happening at home. Can you say a little bit about that with the particular attention to like, what do you then think homemade citizenship makes possible that like a civic or state-based conception of citizenship forecloses? Oh, you're going right to the heart of it. <laughs> oh, let me see if I can articulate this. Uh, I mean, you have articulated it quite well in this book, so you got plenty of material, yes. <laughs> You know, I feel like part of what, there, there's always a tension, right? I mean, I think this is part of why I was so excited by the conversation um, earlier today with you and Martha Jones um, and Tanisha Ford and Sharon Harley, is that, you know, there's no automatic consensus. There's always debate. Right. And so I think that part of how I want to get at this core question you've asked is to think about how I think that homemade citizenship is a way for us to acknowledge that um, I'm not going to play the game of pretending that I believe that Black people simply ingest mainstream ideology. Mm, okay. So even if, even if they seem to be, you know, buying into um, capitalism, right? All of these conduct manuals after emancipation that are telling you to comport yourself in a particular way and to learn how to, um, you know, value store-made things rather than homemade things. Like, even if people are doing all of that, do I really think that what they're simply doing is ingesting capitalism just in a straightforward way. The reason I say that I don't buy that argument is because Black people always know that anytime they get something that is coveted at all by white people, when they get it, they're going to be attacked. So even if they're doing that participation, they can't be doing it simply for um, white acceptance and civic inclusion. The same thing in the, you know, 50s and 60s when people are moving into the suburbs. Like, I just don't buy the idea that the only people who wanted to live in the suburbs were the people who, you know, believed the hype about, you know, the government's own your own home programs. So if that's the case, then homemade citizenship allows me to acknowledge that maybe something more dynamic is going on because it isn't simply an acceptance of the American dream because they know that any semblance of that for them is going to invite injury. So could it really be that that's all they're about? So to me, homemade citizenship gives me the room for that. And I guess the other way that I wanna make sure I talk about it in relationship to that core question is that the dynamism that I see these texts doing in defining and redefining is also the dynamism I want homemade citizenship to offer us as a lens so that in some ways, sometimes homemade citizenship really is about the way that you're watching someone with a conservative kind of definition of success. And in other cases, it's a more radical definition of success, but homemade citizenship holds both of those. And so to my mind, part of what I hope people can get down with me about is the way that homemade citizenship, if it is that dynamic, then part of what it represents is something that's focused on belonging more than it's focused on civic inclusion. Okay. And that to me is an important um, distinction because I think that if we're real about citizenship in the United States, 
And you know I'm committed to reading its discourses and practices and being real about what it does. So what US citizenship does, almost by definition, is it excludes and it attacks and it violates. So the dispossession of native populations, indigenous populations on these lands is part and parcel of citizenship. So if my goals around, you know, my citizenship as an African American look very conservative and align with US citizenship, then that is the extent to which it is part of the dispossession of native peoples. That is part of how it's part of settler colonialism. And yet at the same time, there's something else going on that's about a sense of belonging that gives me some room to know that there's something in addition to the ways in which our most conservative goals are in concert with settler colonialism. So I guess that's the beginning of how I would answer that question. Mm -hmm. And throughout the text, I mean, you map like, because when you're talking about homemade citizenship, I mean, one of the things you say is that it's also deeply heteronormative, right? It's rooted <laughs> in the most like straight up traditional versions of the black family. How do you feel about that as a scholar? Like on the one hand, I hear you granting to these people that what you're going to do is honor their own definition of success. but do we have to define it as success? Do we get to say like, that isn't success, right? And do you, is there any part of you that has a sneaking suspicion that part of the reason we think it's about success is because it is a white model? Like you reject that, but I'm like, are we sure uh -huh, that, uh -huh. it's, that the white model is not informing our notion of what success success is, right? Oh, I love it. You're going straight to the heart of everything that I know is troubling to people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, so let me, I'm going to do my best to answer this in the most complete way because, I mean, in, in, in truth, you know this about me. You know how invested I am in acknowledging and honoring queer intimacies and alternative domesticities. Like, you know how invested I am in that. So this is, this. I'm going to try to get at this as completely as possible. Um, I believe firmly that there is no getting out of this clean, right? So in other words, there is no denying to my mind, and here I'm following Baldwin in some ways, there's no denying that I am thoroughly of this place. This is the land of my birth. <laughs> and um, the people that I'm tracing are people who um, decided that they would stake their claims here and not immigrate elsewhere. So in tracing that, what I am doing is dealing with people, dealing with artists, who are representing strategies and practices that allowed them to continue to pursue success and belonging um, in the, the, the lion's mouth, so to speak. And so I would never claim that their definitions are untouched by the United States capitalism. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that um, the influence of those ideologies they get to be free of. I don't believe that we're honest when we claim that. And so I guess part of the way that, that I would answer what you're saying is to say that um, to my mind, we don't have to accept their definitions to honor what they did. And that I think is what my investment is because you know, part of the reason why I think the heteronormative nuclear family becomes the metonym for giving you the clue that homemade citizenship is happening here, the reason it gets used so much, and wait, let me actually clarify though. Let me be clear that homemade citizenship is being cultivated um, even if I had produced a text that focused on texts that give us queer intimacies, okay? I'm not saying that these are the only ways 
I'm saying that the heteronormative nuclear family can become a signal to us that homemade citizenship is being cultivated. But the reason why I think that these texts that are canonical, and I'll admit to you that part of what I'm invested in is using that success of uh, canonicity okay. as another way of getting at this question, right? So in other words, these canonical texts prioritize that heteronormative nuclear family precisely because they are invested in showing that even when we do exactly what the nation says it will respect, we are attacked. And they are invested in highlighting that. Now, this is what I believe, you know, following Kathy Cohen, for example, right, who has made it clear to us that, look, you know, um, in, in her terms, punks, bull daggers, and welfare queens. The idea that um, I think what I'm watching in our scholarly conversations, I'm watching our ability to recognize violence when we don't conform. So when we um, are fulfilling, when we are not conforming in certain ways, we're attacked and we understand that violence. What I don't think we've gotten as good at recognizing is when we're attacked for conforming and fulfilling the standard the nation claims it respects. And I think that these um, canonical works, the reason they're so invested in the heteronormative nuclear family is because it exposes that violence. It says it clearly can't be about behavior, it's about demographic. These authors would say, look at Trump and how he doesn't fulfill anything you say you're going to respect in terms of this heteronormative nuclear family model and the morality that you claim goes with it. I mean, look at the Christian, anyway. So I'm just saying that part of what's invested here in showing you these black heteronormative nuclear families is to say, it's not about behavior, it's about demographic. And they are invested in exposing the violence that comes to those black people who do that. And I guess the other way I'll say it is, you know, I think about um, Aliyah Abdurrahman's work and the way that she shows us the incredible skepticism, the skepticism that you articulated in the question, that there's a skepticism in Black cultural production about whether it will save us to be this proper subject. There's deep skepticism about it. And part of what I'm saying is that in concert with her findings, I find these conservative looking people to offer the same skepticism, but they're just offering it through the model that looks like it's conforming. Because they're saying, even when we conform, we are viciously attacked. Mm -hmm. That's part of how I would answer it. Yeah. And, you know, this, this, and again, I don't think that we get to, to, to come clean. Like, I'm not claiming, oh, well, there's no, um, whiteness ideology affecting these definitions of success. I'm never going to claim that because I think that we lie when we try to have a certain kind of purity. Right. <laughs> and I'm saying I want us to deal in the reality of where we are. And even in that reality, there are moments to claim as victories. And I just want us to have the tools we need to claim them as victories and not just throw people away. I, 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 this is how I would say that too. I was re-watching Black Panther and you had Killmonger at the end say, you know, I'm going to take my own life because, you know, I'm in concert with those who knew it was better to die than to be enslaved. And I guess what I'm trying to say in this book is that because debate and disagreement and disagreement about how we even define success because that debate about how to define success is part of what makes us a community. I'm invested in us not throwing away the ancestors who um, decided that they would jump off board. I'm not gonna act like that's not part of a legacy I'm damn proud of. And I'm not gonna act like those who found ways to survive under bondage 
are part of ancestry that I want to throw away. You know, these, the, the, this, I'm not my ancestors as if, you know, we're so much more courageous than they were. I'm, I believe homemade citizenship can give us the tools to not throw any of our ancestors away because all of them represent different strategies for dealing with this violent ass situation. Word. It's violent and horrible. And I respect your ways of dealing with it. And I'm just asking that you respect the ways I deal with it. And then the way that that person does and the way that that person does, because what I think homemade citizenship can help us do is see that all of us are doing the same thing, which is to try to define and redefine and recalibrate what this is going to mean in these horrible circumstances. So this is interesting, right? I mean, one, my brain is going multiple different directions, but okay. So A, I'm thinking quickly, like, it's interesting because I could imagine, you know, a young person reading this and being like, this is all respectability politics. Like, it's not success, right? So I appreciate that you're driving us towards a bit more precision, right, around this. And so that there's, so that that, because that, frame can become a cudgel and it can make certain things obscure. So I think your framework here helps us with that. But I'm also, I want to talk about this community conversation. So you argue throughout the book that we should think about these texts and the way that folks are grappling with success as staging a community conversation. The thing that I'm interested in is the community conversation gets rough in all these texts. It's rough in quicksand. It's rough in the wine and the wilderness. Like there's no moment when black people are not rough on each other. And that was a nice course correction for me because we're rough on each other now. And so I wonder, do you think that this debate about success is still driving our community conversation? Particularly like it mostly plays out on Twitter and Facebook as far as we can ascertain it. But do you think it's driven by the same kinds of challenges? It absolutely is. And, you know, this is the reason why I think it's so important to think through this lens, because like you said, it gets rough. Like, okay, I'm thinking right now about wine in the wilderness. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, wait. I was like, wait. Right. Yeah. But but you know what? Let me even back up and in and, and that same chapter, go to Raisin in the Sun. Uh, yeah. So here's my thing. Okay. What we miss in Raisin in the Sun, when we think of it through the lens of resistance to segregation, and we don't think about it as pursuing success, we miss how much debate and disagreement is happening in that household about how to define success. And what I'm saying is when we keep that protest lens, we don't actually get to where I think Hansberry wants us to get, which is I know as a community, we're going to keep debating. And I need y'all to start recognizing that this patriarchal church inflected definition of success that Mama Lena is enacting is something that is silencing Benitha. It is something that is keeping beneath the beneath. How do we deal with that if we're so worried about pretending that it's just about resisting segregation? When we think it's just about resisting segregation, then all we can do is cheer for Mama Lena for resisting segrega- segregation. But I think Hansberry is up to a lot more than that, but we can't see it if we're not looking for definitions and redefinitions and challenges to the definitions of success. So you're absolutely right. It constantly gets rough. And you mentioned quicksand. And in that same chapter, I look at, you know, uh, their eyes are watching God. God, And I'm so invested in the way that that those two texts help us see race men are defining success through propriety. Yeah. Look, I, I got a question about that because you make this argument in quicksand and I was like, she's saying some deep shit here about the way that race men do. And I, you kept saying that in quicksand that race men that they were ashamed of their desire and so it affected that they kept on essentially projecting it and i 
I got it, but I didn't fully get it. But I was also like, because they still be doing this shit today. They still do it. Okay, okay. So because you, you yeah. look, your chapter in Beyond Respectability about that nineteen, that nineteen sixties, <laughs> right? And all of the ways that you know black intellectuals. Anyway, so yeah, they yeah. still do it, right? Um, and so yes, that. So, but you know what? This is the other way that your work and um, actually your work in concert with the Pleasure Ninjas yeah. really, really got me to thinking, right? Um, it's you, Joan Morgan, Treva <laughs> Lindsay, <laughs> Esther Arma. Tyler yeah, Story, yeah. Tyler, right, exactly, right? And so watching and listening and learning from you all got me to see what was going on there. The race men were defining success in a way that was all about propriety that made them um, push down their desire. And the these characters that we see are defining success in a way that needs to include pleasure. And it is so obvious the way that Larson makes it clear that these Black women do not want to get married. Marriage is not attractive to them. But they realize that these race men are so caught up in a definition of success that forsakes desire that they better get on board and deal with this race motherhood framework, right? That Aaron Chapman has taught us about. This race motherhood is running stuff whether I wanted to or not. So let me see how I can maneuver this. And so it is fascinating to me the way that Larson makes it clear that that's exactly what um, Helga is doing, but she's not doing it with nearly the skill as yeah. the character whose husband she was trying to get with, and I can't remember his name. But like, you know, she's yeah. the one who had the skill of navigating these Black men, these race men who didn't know how to define success to include pleasure. She right. had the skill. <laughs> who am I getting this girl? Yes. Okay. okay. But wait, yeah. I'm going to stay, yeah. on, this, I'm gonna stay okay. on this getting rough stuff. Okay, I got it. Yep. The conversation's getting rough. Yeah. Can we talk about how the conversation gets rough and beloved? Can we talk about how, you know, Setha is able to give Paul D the room he needs to acknowledge his past, but not be defined by it. Yeah. But when he has an opportunity to support her in acknowledging her past, but not having to let that past define her future, right. he's unable to do that and he counts her feet. You got two feet, Setha, not four. So if that's not an example of the community conversation getting rough, I don't know what is. But right inside the text, that's part of it. Inside the text, I'll say inside the text for another moment. Think about how the community within Beloved is okay with pride in male beings. Even the rooster can have pride and we all understand that as a community. But when Setha is not bowed, was her head a little too high? Her back a little too straight? Did she have a little too much confidence in the decisions she made? Was she, right? So there's a way in which I believe that text, again, though, we got to read for success. We can't look at simply how might this be answering um, a white audience? How might this be answering white American society that doesn't acknowledge slavery, right? Morrison said, the novel Beloved had to exist because there wasn't a, a, a monument to slavery, not even a bench by the road. But my belief is that if we think that's about just talking to white people, then we miss how she is trying to give a more complete accounting of slavery that takes Black women's experiences very seriously. And so that is the way that I get to the community conversation outside the text where it's like, okay, in this moment, we still have a community conversation that's being driven by Alex Haley's roots. Mm -hmm. And in that telling, in that trying to honor what slavery is and was and how it continues to have an effect, in that uh, 
uh, attempt to address that, Haley is invested in, you know, the things that Hansberry and Childress were critiquing in the decades before, which was this kind of black power masculinist ideology. And so I'm just like, wait a second, but we only see it if we read for success. We only see it if we read through the lens of how are black women defining success, right? How is Setha defining it? And so much of what Morrison does is she shows us this journey of how Setha is trying to define a home outside of the master's house as one in which she not only can love her children, but she can also love a partner of her choice. And we saw in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl that that's part of how the definition gets tweaked. Yeah. And, and we're trying to continue, like, so if I'm defining success in a nation that will sometimes tolerate my love for my children, but never tolerate my love for a partner of my choice, then when we get to Beloved and Setha, and we're looking for how success is defined, we see, as you said, again, the granular, like that, that's what's important. Like, if we can't get into the nitty gritty of it, then to my mind, we can't get to lived realities and take some lessons from our forebears. That's what gives us the lessons from it because their work was complicated in the same way that our situation is complicated and we close ourselves off from certain insights if we have kind of that blunt, you know, approach. So again, I think only by looking for how Setha is defining and redefining success can we start to see how, as you say, the community conversation gets rough. Because if you're gonna take black women seriously, if you're gonna take their experiences seriously, then you gotta look at how are the ways that my black male community members, how are the ways that they define success not making room for me. And that is what, that's why the conversations get rough. Because so often what these texts are doing is that they are engaging in the community conversation and engaging in what has become accepted knowledge in the community conversation, right? So by the time we get to that chapter, the accepted knowledge is the emasculating matriarch who is not just coming from Moynihan, but is also coming from Black Power rhetoric that says all of this stuff is Black women's fault and y'all need to get it together and learn how to support Black men and subordinate yourself to them so we can advance as a race. And Morrison and Octavia Butler and coming into that moment and saying, but wait, if we looked at how our community conversation is defining success and this dominant idea of how we should be defining it around this male head of household, then we miss the fact that it continues to be a debate. And so the roughness comes when you actually are acknowledging all the voices and not silencing certain voices. Yeah. Wow. All right. I'm <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more thing before it's time for Q&A, girl. We've been going. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, there's so much. Look, this book is chock full of wonderful insight, y'all. So you got to buy it. I mean, look, this is just a teaser. We're not going to give you everything. That's the whole point. <laughs> okay. Tell the people about Know Your Place Aggression. We ain't even talked about Know Your Place Aggression yet, which is, you know, which is, which I remember years ago when when you were, I think, formulating this and you would be like, you, you know, you wrote several pieces in the popular press and then you have an academic piece about it. Um, and here, much of how you understand white violence, one of the things that I like about this is that in some ways, you know, white people think that they real sophisticated with their racist, ra racist violence. And in the end, you just like, actually, y'all are quite pedestrian and all you're really trying to do is put us in some <laughs> place, right? So talk to the people about Know Your Place Violence. Know Your Place Violence. Yeah, know your place aggression. Yeah. Um, 
you know, one of the best things I could say about Know Your Place Aggression is recognizing, ha recognizing it has been sanity saving for me. <laughs> um, and because what it allows me to do when I recognize, so Know Your Place Aggression is, um, you know, kind of this dynamic, flexible array of forces that answer the achievements of marginalized groups such that their success brings aggression as often as praise. When I understand that the aggression I'm experiencing, the foulness I'm encountering, is because somebody wants to put me back in my proper place. It allows me to have a lot less investment in what they think and do. And that has been so freeing to where, in all honesty, it has shaped all of the mentoring that I've done of faculty of color and um, faculty of different uh, marginalized groups within academia. It has literally shaped it because I want people to be able to not carry weight that doesn't belong to them. This, this, this cloak of shame that what we call microaggressions are intended to make us feel, right? That, you know, you're, anyway, I won't even go through all that. I think the best thing I'll do is say to people, I do have a piece called Identifying White Mediocrity and Know Your Place Aggression, a form of self-care. Um, it's on my website, it's all kinds of places. It is definitely the place I want people to look um, because I did my best in that piece. As you said, I wrote about it several different times, but that's the piece in which I did my most comprehensive job of trying to deal with things like ableism and Islamophobia and transphobia and so on. So I really tried to do a job there. But all of this is simply to say that it allows me not to take on what those aggressive gestures and actions are meant for me to take on. And that is why it is so very important mm. and so sanity saving. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm going to ask you a final question as people cue your questions up. Y'all got questions. I know y'all got questions. We got a good amount of time for Q&A. And so I just want to talk to you a little bit about like process. And one of the things that I notice about this book, I mean, it's deeply researched. It's it's an academic book, but it's so accessible. Um, even when you're deep in the thick of close readings, there's ways that even if those are not texts you're familiar with that you can, you resonate with the story or the lesson or the critique or the caution that's being offered by the text. And so I just wonder about how you understand yourself as a writer, because academic you know, academic writing is changing. Folks are thinking a lot about com appealing to publics. You do a lot of activist work, you do a lot of public writing, and yet you've managed to kind of, you have managed to be both still in that scholarly tradition and also to write in a way that feels accessible. And I wonder if you have some thoughts or insights about that that you would share with scholars who are really trying to figure out how to navigate that line. Thank you so much. That I, it means so much to me that, that you believe that even the close readings give folk a way in, even if you don't know the text, because I definitely hope to do precisely that. I don't want people to feel like they have to go and read the text to understand why it's so valuable for our understanding of community conversation. Um, and, 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 and what these Black women artists are pushing back against and making and thereby making room for themselves within even the community conversation, right? Again, I'm not talking they're pushing back and resisting white racism. I'm talking about within the community conversation, how do they make room for their truths? So that's, a, that's high praise and I really, really appreciate it. Um, I think the most honest way I can answer that question, I think is um, in some ways, part of what I'm invested in is, um, <sighs> you know, taking my cues from, okay, this might be a nice, neat way to answer it so that I don't go on and on like I did before. Um, I'm a big believer in what I call a composite mentor. Mm. And so what I mean by that is that I create my ideal mentor um, by creating a composite that includes lots of different people that I admire. And so one way to think about answering your question is to say that there are people that I admire who are part of my composite mentor who are 
hardcore in academia only speak to academics. And there are others who are very much public facing like you, um, who, you know, I watch how you work and take that as part of my composite. There are other people who are in my composite mentor simply by the way that I watch how they navigate leadership in um, societies. There are other people who are part of my composite mentor just by the way they operate in terms of teaching and pedagogy. So I guess that's my most honest way of answering it is to say that I'm always looking for models and inspiration and I do my best to synthesize that into something that feels true for who I am. And I think that, you know, who I am is someone who is invested in you know, I believe that what I have to say is important and that you shouldn't have to have a PhD to understand it. Awesome. Okay, y'all, it's your turn. So um, our fearless publicist, Heather, is going, to, um, is going to help us moderate this portion of the, of the evening. All right. Okay, so we've got some really excellent questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the one from Joan. Um, so she says, Thank you for this wonderful event. Karitha, I know you end with Michelle Obama. Could you tell us about some other contemporary examples that you think we could understand better through the formulation of Black success and the white supremacist response to it? Shoot, everybody. Me, you, Brittany, uh, <laughs> my mama. Uh, <laughs> you know, like literally all of us. I mean, I think that, you know, what I'm invested in the reason why the Obamas ended up, well, first of all, I got to shout out um, Gabrielle Foreman because mm -hmm. Michelle Obama was never supposed to be in this book. When I first started writing about this, I had done some stuff on her, written some things about how interesting I found it, <laughs> that she was promoting the Let's Move campaign without ever referencing the fact that she had been an executive director at the University of Chicago Medical School, and how invested I was in understanding that move of calling herself mom in chief as a reflection of how racist and sexist this country is. So, I had been thinking that and doing that kind of work, but I never imagined that as part of this book. And Gabrielle Foreman was the one who said, wait a second, why not? And then once she said it, I couldn't unthink it. And so I think, so, so I guess I wanna say in response to that, like, um, I feel like part of what Michelle Obama helps us do is show how if, Michelle and Barack Obama can experience know your place aggression in the form of, you know, wanting to see him in a noose, for example, right? And of course, I come at that in the book through the angle of her, because, you know, I see it as aggression toward her and her domestic success that you are targeting him in that way, right? So it's a way of centering women again. Um, but if this prominent family is experiencing know your place aggression, then certainly every day black folk are. And so once Foreman gave me that idea, I felt like it was a way for us to understand um, in very stark terms what exactly I mean by the many forms that aggression takes. Because the point is, it, whether we call it a microaggression, whether it's assault, whether it's murder, like that whole entire spectrum, whether the aggression is symbolic or physical and material, the message is still you don't belong and you need to know your proper place. And so what I'm interested in doing is saying, if you can notice that someone like the Obamas experience know your place aggression, then how much more should that allow you to see that when Harriet Jacobs talks about her mom being told how dare you be upset that your, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Keckley is saying that her mom was told after her father was sold away, how dare you act like you're upset? If you're so upset, then get another man off of my plantation. How dare we not see that as know your place aggression? So to my mind, using a prominent example like Michelle Obama is really the purpose of it for me is so that we can see those other examples. Because I think that it doesn't take a remarkable success to attract intense white violence. 
your success can be very, very minor and it attracts that violence. So I guess what I'm saying is the only reason Michelle Obama matters in this case is that she helps us to see that she's part of a tradition and part of um, a very consistent American practice that is coming toward Black success, whether it is a grand prominent success or a minuscule success of simply knowing that I'm a human with human feelings and shouldn't be treated like cattle, for example. Um, so, so I'm very sincere in the answer I gave at the beginning, even though I laughed to say, we're an example, me, you, Brittany, my mama. Like, I mean that. I think that that is what we are encountering every single time we have someone trying to remind us of our so-called proper place. Um, I hope that answers it. Before you jump to the next question, somebody in the chat shouted Kamala when you were talking as of a course. contemporary example. Anyway, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Kamala is definitely another very prominent example. As soon as she gets that nomination, look at all the foolishness that came out of the woodwork. And I guess, you know, the reason why going ahead and talking about Kamala is also important is because it's another example to my mind of why it was so important for me to move from the lesson I learned in living with lynching, that Black success beckons the mob, to moving to know your place aggression, to understand that the success of marginalized groups inspires aggression as, as often as praise. Because I think that part of what we can see in Kamala's example is the way that her South Asian identity becomes fodder. Simply the fact that she's a woman becomes fodder. Like all of those categories, because they are not straight white men, attract violence. So absolutely. And, and yeah. Okay, so we've got even more excellent questions. Um, a couple people have asked about the cover. So I'm gonna read Dawn's question. Um, hi, Brittany. Hi, Caritha. Caritha, would you please talk about Charles White's art used for both living with lynching and for From Slave Cabins to the White House? Is that Don Durant? Yes. Ah, Don! <laughs> oh, we love Don. Both Brittany and I. She is important to both of our. <laughs> love you, Don. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, I think, you know, Dawn takes a lot of credit for that. With living with lynching, I don't recall the designer's name who was in place when the cover for living with lynching happened, but I love both of my covers, so I love this question, so if you'll indulge me. So with living with lynching, I had a very particular idea of what I wanted the image to be, but I, and, and so I was prepared to hire someone to create exactly what I wanted, but I was prepared to show them <laughs> that, um, that what, how I wanted the black figures to be rendered. And the rendering I wanted was Charles White's style. So as Brittany just held up that book, Charles White's um, style is very distinctive to me. I know a Charles White anytime I see it anywhere and love to like guess and see if I'm right. But anyway, so I gave the designer the Charles White that ended up on the cover of living with lynching just because I wanted them to do the image that I was describing, but to use this style to render the black living figures. And that person wrote back and said, okay, I'm open to this idea you're articulating, but do you not realize that this is the perfect image for living with lynching? And so I think we even hopped on the phone and he walked me through his reading of the image and I was like, oh my God, that's perfect. So then when it came to this book, I had three pictures that I had saved over the many, many years that I was working on this book. Can we talk about the fact that I finished the first draft of it in May of 2016? So it has been a long time between then and now. And so during that time of doing the revisions and everything, I would just periodically collect images. And a lot of my friends, actually, I think including Dawn, um, went to the retrospective of Charles White at the Chicago Museum of Art. And I saw them posting pictures on Facebook. And I was like, oh, that would be one to put in my collection of possibilities. So let me not keep rambling on that. Basically um, submitted, it, submitted my three ideas 
Um, the designers said that they would take it into account. They made this image, they made this cover with that image and it was so much better than anything I could have thought of. My first choice was actually much more incendiary. It was uh, the picture of Jan Brewer shaking her finger at Obama because I thought that was a perfect picture of know your place aggression, but I love this even more. So all of this is to say that I love the fact that we were able to do Charles White images on both books now and Don is the person who saw that like possibility more than I did because I was so caught up in the finger pointing. So, so yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Okay, so we've gotten a couple of questions of people wanting you to expand more on the concept of homemade citizenship. Um, so I'm gonna start with this one from Jeffrey Lanier Jones. And he asks, how do you understand the connection between feminism and homemade citizenship in terms of black women's agency? Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I define homemade citizenship as a deep sense of success and belonging that does not rely on mainstream recognition or civic inclusion. And I think that the reason why Black women are so important to how I wanted to investigate this is because, you know, as Kimberly Crenshaw has taught us, when you study people who, you know, live at the intersection of multiple oppressions, you gain insight into the experiences of people who live at intersections with less traffic. And so I just think that when we look at Black women's strategies for continuing to pursue success despite the fact that the violence coming at them is both driven by racism and by sexism, then we gain some real awareness of what does it take to keep pursuing that success knowing that your success makes you a target what does it take to do that what are the strategies you need to do that and because black women are dealing with both racism and sexism i think that they reveal um you know those strategies now i very much hope that my demonstrating this by using canonical black women's texts only makes it that much easier for someone who wants to do an exploration of how pursuing success despite the violence it brings is being enacted by queer artists and writers, is being enacted by artists with disabilities, is being enacted by Muslim artists. Like, I really hope that what I've given is a real way of showing what happens when you approach the art and literature of people in these marginalized groups looking for how they're defining success rather than looking for how they're protesting. What happens when you take for granted, of course they know they're human. Of course they know they deserve citizenship. Even if I use the nation's definition of what a good citizen is, most times they're going to inhabit that definition far better than the straight white man who gets to be the archetypal citizen. So I'm gonna take for granted that these artists know that their humanity is not in question and their citizenship is not in question. So then what happens if I take that for granted? If I actually acknowledge that maybe they take it for granted and I'm looking through the lens of success and achievement instead, what might that illuminate about their work that I can't see when I'm constantly assuming that all they're doing is railing against dominant discourse and practice. So I hope that gets to the heart of this great question you've asked is that absolutely this is the reason why homemade citizenship is so well understood through marginalized groups because they are the ones who have to pursue their success while being countered at every turn. Okay, so I have another question um, from Caroline Gepard um, about homemade citizenship. And she wants to know, can you say more about homemade citizenship? Oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Caroline. <laughs> I meant to um, ask Shamara's question. I'm so sorry. We, I feel like this kind of been answered though. If you don't feel like it has been answered already, feel free to put in another question. Um, okay. I, wanted to, I wondered how you see homemade citizenship and even success as defined by these narratives 
matches up with the idealized good immigrant narrative and the long history of undocumented black folk in the US. Oh, that's great. Oh my goodness. So in the introduction, I talk about the way that um, that what I'm tracing with African Americans um, definitely needs to be understood in terms of um, especially current debates on immigration. Um, but in terms of the, the question is framed more in terms of how do we understand it in terms of the immigrant narrative, I think. I think part of what I'm in interested in is when you ask that question, I'll tell you what comes to mind for me immediately. Um, what comes to mind is <laughs> uh, if you're not a white immigrant, that's when we got problems. Okay, so let's be let's be clear about that first of all. Because the immigrants of yeah, okay. All right. So so let's be clear about that. So then I immediately start thinking about the way that this country says that it celebrates entrepreneurship. But when that entrepreneur is black or brown, then, oh, if that entrepreneur is Latino, for example, we'll say, oh, you got to be scared of a taco truck on every corner. So supposedly it's entrepreneurship that we admire, but in fact, it's only if it comes in the package of a straight white man that we admire it. So that to me is one of the ways that this intersects with what I'm talking about in the book, which is to say that the aggression I'm talking about, the know your place aggression that I'm talking about in relationship to African Americans is definitely being applied in other ways. And so this idea that you can be cast as a threat for being an entrepreneur if you're a Latino entrepreneur gets to the heart to my mind of how we need to trouble any easy assumptions we have about um, how much this country admires and elevates an immigrant narrative, right? Because it gets challenged whenever those immigrants aren't considered white. The immigrant narrative that we admire, and I guess part of what I'm thinking about, again, in context of your question, I'm thinking about the powerful work that Isabel Wilkerson did in The Warmth of, the, of Their Sons and the way that she showed us how this epic narrative that we associate with immigrants is also applicable to African Americans. What I'm suggesting is that part of why that is important as a move is because the thing we don't say outright is it's white immigrants that get to be part of that narrative that we as a nation celebrate and everybody else is dealing with the backlash of any success they have. So I don't know if that actually went straight to the heart of that question, but there, I hope. <laughs> okay, here's another one. This one is from Adolf Young and he says, Karifa, what do you hope to have black men take from reading this book? How do you hope that we will connect with it? Interesting. I just hope you see yourself reflected that we are in a community conversation that has some voices that maybe haven't been lifted up, right? And so, I mean, this is really the work that Beyond Respectability by Brittany Cooper does, right? It shows us the way that the way we've been taught our history, our intellectual history, even in terms of Black thinkers, has been very much um, a male-centered um, narrative. And so part of what I hope this book does is it shows you the way that there has never been a time in the community conversation where debate wasn't happening and different voices weren't there. And so I hope that this book in lifting up community conversation just lets you in on maybe those voices you hadn't acknowledged. And then in the cases you know, where Brittany said, sometimes it gets rough, Part of what I hope the book does is show you the way that even when, for example, Benita, even when the voice of the single Black woman is drowned out for the most part, Hansberry preserves that voice. And so the, by preserving that voice, it lives on as part of the community conversation that you and I, Adolf, are having now. So I think that that 
is what all of us can take is just a, a greater appreciation of the richness and dynamism and diversity and loving tensions that make the community conversation because part of what you'll know from even just the introduction that I believe to my core is that part of what makes us a community is that we're willing to debate each other. I believe debate is an embodied practice of belonging. I know I belong to this community because I care enough to debate you about it. So, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so a couple of people have been inspired by your conversation about quicksand. Um, Kimberly Lamb wants to know if the status of homemade links to aesthetic practices, such as making clothes or dressing up, and Sarah uh, wants to know, how does feminism or homemade citizenship connect for you to fashion? Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna use this question as an opportunity to plug what is now my favorite piece of writing that I don't believe enough people have read, <laughs> which is, um, it's called The Delicate Balancing Act of Black Women's Memoir and it's in electric literature. And in that piece, I talk about Michelle Obama in the context of Elizabeth Keckley, who I talk about in chapter one of this book. Elizabeth Keckley was the dressmaker to Abraham Lincoln's wife. And so I'm invested in the way that, you know, part of what it means to really grapple, I think, with Black womanhood is the legacy um, of, as the questioner mentioned, quilting and though like, so there's a way in which part of how I even got to the point of saying what I say about Michelle Obama in that chapter, let me back up to be clear. So in the chapter six about Michelle Obama, I read her public persona as first lady as a performance text. And so what that means in concrete terms is I read her decisions about how to wear her hair, the clothes she chooses, her bodily presentation, and the decisions she made about how to decorate the White House. I read all of those as components of her public persona as first lady. And so I guess the short answer is to say that fashion and, 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 and choices about even decor of one's home all are part of the investigation I'm invested in because, you know, if nothing else, one of the ways, and I mean, we know this from the Volia Glimpse work. Um, I mean, there are other scholars that are coming to mind. Like, we know that white women in particular, but white men as well, did not like it when Black people looked good or dressed in a certain way. I mean, that's part of the way that you end up in the 60s with the Sunday best ethos of the Black church and the civil rights movement decisions about being in a suit on that street. Um, the idea that you would be dressed in a way that supposedly only white people should be able to dress, that's been one of the many battlegrounds <laughs> um, for asserting Black citizenship. And so I feel myself starting to ramble. So I think I've answered the question, I hope for the most part. <laughs> but all of this is to say fashion, quilts, all of that is certainly part of it. I can't claim that the chapters always go in depth like I do. They don't always go in depth um, on that, but it definitely will be part of what you find in the text. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but this seems like a really good question to close us out with. Um, so Anonymous asks, do you have a dream impact or audience for your book? Everybody, everybody should read it because it will allow us to understand exactly the most important thing, which is where Brittany started us off. The most important thing that I want us to understand is that white violence is the reaction that's the reaction. 
Black people are marching toward accomplishment, minding their business, and white violence emerges to interrupt their journey. If I do nothing else, at least I want us to know that we're all taught that, you know, so-called minorities can only react. But the truth is, so-called minor minorities are simply marching toward accomplishment and dominant violence comes in to counter them, right? Queer people are marching toward accomplishment, minding their own business, and dominant discourse that says that the only valid existence is a straight existence comes in to interrupt them. It's not about, so I think that's the most important thing is understanding what the real cause and effect relationship is. It's not that marginalized people are reacting. It's that dominant discourse is constantly jumping to squash anything that demonstrates how not dominant it is. All right, well, that seems like a pretty good place to end. Carissa, do you have any final words for us? All right, well, this time has flown as I knew it would with my lovely Brittany. Um, so I am just going to close by saying that I'm really grateful for um, Heather for putting this together for the University of Illinois Press. Um, for helping to make this happen. Really grateful for Semicolon Bookstore as our partner. So grateful to Brittany for making time for me um, in the middle of everything else going on. And I also want to give a shout out again to Don Durant because she's important to both me and Brittany and also to Tanya McKinnon, who is again, very important to me and Brittany. But I just, the final word is, you know, many, many thanks to all of you who made time to be here during this live session, as well as to all the people who will watch it later. I just appreciate that you're willing to engage these ideas because I'm really proud of the book and just want as many people as possible to engage with the ideas. So thank you all for engaging the ideas. Have a good night. Girl. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, hon. I so appreciate you. All right, y'all. Have a good night.